That's it. We're happy with that. Thank you very much. OK, standing by. Hello, young man. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, okay, nine, seven. That's what the score should have been. My mum was a bit footballer, you know. <laughs> My dad was who never missed a match, <laughs> went to all the matches at Middlesbrough, was a huge Borough supporter, was absolutely thrilled. That's the young man who's been scoring all the goals. We dictators like to talk a lot. Complex. We all like to be liked. A purist. Play it on the green grass, not in the air. Get in there! That's what I pay you for! A lover of the simple things. One thing you haven't got in football is time. And at times, his own reflection. Now, Clough, I've had enough. Stop it. Clough tells it all. Mid-70s, late 70s. He turned the average into the extraordinary. He captured that decade. The portrayal of Brian Clough in that book. But the truth is absolutely outrageous. Isn't always black and white. I would like the supreme job. It's a bit cold, isn't it? <laughs> he continues to play the lead role. Who do you think you are? Brian Clough. Not my type of man. From inside the FA. There wasn't a vote. The decision was made beforehand to the heart of the darkness at Leeds. They wanted to teach Klopp a lesson. I want to be like me. From Derby to the Bernabeu and back again. <laughs> through the eyes of those who really knew. I don't know if somebody's messing about up there. This is Clough, the afterlife of Brian. This isn't work talking about this, man. This is absolute pleasure and delight for me, and I'm sure it's going to be for you. I knew he was very, very dedicated. From the word go, he took his football very, very seriously and really was very grateful that he'd had the chance to play football. Otherwise, he said I would have ended up in the, in the offices at ICI. It's been said the unfulfilled player made for the brilliant manager. Brian Clough scored 251 goals, most at second division level. Played for England, but only twice in a career cut short by injury. I couldn't describe him in one, two words or whatever. You know, he was our dad and, you know, most people love their dad, so uh, that never changes. I'm certain that situation developed, excuse me. Yeah, and this bloody thing drives me crackers. Yeah. Nigel Clough, you OK? Yeah, fine yourself. Tell him I'm busy. I think if you can't do anything else, then you end up as a manager. <laughs> Probably it's the last resort. November 2008, Burton Albion Football Club. How long a manager now? Uh, about ten years and two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Dad finished playing, you know, at 27 through injury, and he's, you know, he's, he's then got to provide for his family for the next however many years. So many of them think they can go into management at a high level straight away. At Hartlepool, he learned his trade. He said, you've got to learn to sort of work with, you know, less, you know, not as talented players first. To say experience is very, very valuable. Well, if it is valuable, I've had a hell of a lot. I didn't really get to know him until he became a manager at Derby County. And then I used to go to matches and see him after the match. And then we'd go home for a bit of supper and he used to be the cook, actually. He was, all, he was doing the cooking while I was talking to Barbara. Good friend, Geoffrey. Yeah, he, he's great. Yes, I like him. He's a, I, I tell everyone he's a pussycat, really. <laughs> and what that Th These are the best things that's happened to me in my life. When you come home, you get things into perspective, and I'm afraid, it, it, you know, it fades into the background very quickly when three of them are on me to me. So, journalist just asked me, in actual fact, how are we going to prepare for the League Cup against Leeds? Well, it's an absolutely ridiculous question because the very fact we're playing Leeds is preparation enough for us. There were no dissension amongst the board as far as uh, giving him a free hand. Not only a free hand in the, uh, as far as the manager's job as football, a free hand as far as the old setup at uh, the baseball ground. He wanted to fashion a team that people would enjoy coming to see. Good football, you know, um, played in the right way. Within two years of Brian Clough's arrival, 
Derby County were second division champions. He's a young manager, he's a hungry manager. And then he's got someone called Peter Taylor who actually ends up being a fantastic judge of which are the right players to be brought to the club to do a specific job. Hold it, hold it! I intend to go with Brian Clough to uh, the top of the tree. And that, we'll start at Derby. In Brian's eyes, he spoke the truth. And it was simple, it was direct, and very, very much to the point. And you, you just beat it back into the field by about five yards. Well, if you'd have been bloody standing there when I got down, you'd have been over on the right wing. And if you didn't like it? Um, you didn't last long. But how do you react, though, when someone from your playing staff comes in and says, boss, I think you're doing this wrongly? Good, well, I ask him which way he thinks it should be done. We get down to it, and then we talk about it for 20 minutes, and then we decide I was right. I think you need dictators, but if you've got a good dictator, who's going to complain? What similarities are there? Discipline. You know, how the players behave on the pitch how you treat the players, how you look after them, and, and what's expected of them. Whatever job he'd have gone on and done, uh, well, if it hadn't have been football management, he'd have, if he'd have stayed at ICI, he'd have probably ended up running ICI and along the same, with the same principles uh, as he did with football. The things that are hard work to other managers, not hard work to me. Uh, the discipline side of it and the training, the coaching, these are not problems. <laughs> Here they are, the usual suspects. <laughs> hey! Got a bit of a dead leg. <laughs> yeah, a big tough centre half with a bit of a dad like goodness me. Oh, you are a bloody disgrace! Now get with him! For missing the target from there, you want bloody shooting! Brian didn't do what you'd call normal things. Oh, it's bloody rubbish! It's rubbish! We used to stay at the Midland Hotel on Friday nights, and Brian all of a sudden would walk in with a tray of you know, he'd have about 16 half pints of beer. And and those sort of things, you know, the normal puncher at the time would have been shocked. But that was Brian. He just walked in with it with a tray. There you are, lads. And the basic idea for that was to prepare us, relax us, for a football match the following day. Get in there. That's what I pay you for. Many people who didn't know him thought he was just loud and brash. He wasn't. You couldn't have the amount of success that he had as a player and then go on as manager without being bright as a button. Good managers make good sides. There's no such thing as a side making a manager. Bill Shankly said he took a pigsty and made it into a football club at Derby, he said, which, um, you know, he was quite chuffed about, really. <laughs> Do you think you might become unbearable if you win the championship? Oh, I've become the most lovable character that you've ever met in your blinking life. Oh, there's German! By 1972, Derby County were league champions for the first time in their history. Modestly, Clough described it as one of the miracles of the century. Oh, yes! How old was he when uh, they were winning the championship at Derby? He wasn't even 40, was he? To put that into perspective now, there's very few younger managers uh, doing that now, you know. But thanks very much, yeah. Another agent. They were heady days, and Brian loved it, and I think there'd have been probably a lot of managers who would have disliked the, the fact that Brian Clough had won the first division. I'm conceited in respect of having got a side like Derby from where we were Certainly. and worked bloody hard for four years and got them to where we are now. If he had a big head before, it was, it was ten times bigger afterwards. <laughs> I think conceit and arrogance is part of a man's makeup. Perhaps I've got too much. <sighs> He's probably the most charismatic manager that um, the game has known. I accept the point that I do not know every single manager that has been in Brazil or Portugal, but Brian Clough would say, well, who cares? My guest tonight is Brian Clough. The press christened Clough Old Big Ed. In the early 70s, he was much more than a back page lead. Football had its first TV evangelist. He became massively big at the time. Not only that, he was worth listening to. 
God gave us a bit of ability to kick a ball about on a football field and we tend to forget everything else. And then suddenly at 33, 34, we're out of it and we don't quite know how to fill the gaps. Well, this is lack of education. And Brian used to do a programme every Sunday morning, I think. He used to travel down and he was on with Brian Moore, bless him. And that was, a, everybody wanted to watch that programme and, and say, oh, what, what was Brian saying today? And he would come out with some quite outrageous stuff. <laughs> The number of people who said to me, you know, I don't like football talk, but I never miss Brian on television. They call me in and say he's on. In the studio once more today, Brian Clough to give his views on the action you're about to see. He was just himself. He was a natural. He came on and he talked to the camera. He didn't put a, uh, did anything for effect. He was, he, he was saying the same as if he went outside and was talking to a fellow in the street. You have to be yourself. And for him, it was as easy as falling asleep. They've played seven matches, they've conceded 14 goals, they haven't won a game, any defender worth his salt would want to get out of a side like that. I mean, when Brian spoke, it was riveting. There's certain players in the game who couldn't take the ball from my wife, and Bob's one of them. Uh, they might be lucky enough to have a run in a cup, but as far as league's concerned, they haven't got a prayer. I think you're identified with the people, the supporters. We've got it all wrong then, myself. I'm afraid you have, yes. He spoke a language that they understood. Gunter Nexa makes Jimmy look like a navvy. Well, I don't agree with that, Malcolm. <laughs> uh, quite frankly, the only bit I liked uh, was this bit with me in it now. He'd be, he'd be thinking to himself, I wonder what Brian Clough thinks I'm thinking. <laughs> That's what he'll be thinking. Please forgive me, this is not anybody imitating me. I have got a bit of a cold. <laughs> and I do bloody talk like this all the time. Arrogant? Yes, but what's the difference between super confidence and arrogance? Cassius Clay was arrogant, but we loved him because he was bloody good at what he did. And we're delighted to welcome Muhammad Ali, particularly as he has something rather important to say to all big match viewers and to one contributor in particular. There's some fella in London, England, named some Bran... Uh, Bran Clough, some soccer player or something. I heard all the way in Indonesia that this fella talks too much. They say he's another Muhammad Ali. There's just one Muhammad Ali. <laughs> I'm the talker. Now, Clough, I've had enough. Stop it. Well, are you going to stop it? <laughs> no, no, I want to fight him. <laughs> Mum used to say to him before he went out, she used to say, can't you just go on and talk? like those other people do, but not say anything. Well, look, I know perhaps on occasions I've talked too, no, too much. I know perhaps on occasions I've been a little bit way out. I know perhaps that I haven't done things according to the book. But, gentlemen, that is my record in six years or seven years or eight years of management. And this is what you cannot argue with if it's an impressive record. I'd sort of sit, you know, ready for... <laughs> What he was going to say, you know, I wasn't, um... We, we sort of got used to it, you know what I mean? My man says to me, why can't you be like Bob Wilson? And not upset anybody, and Bob doesn't swear, and Bob doesn't do that. And, you know, if she's not careful, I shall just uh, renege completely, and uh, my man will have a new son, and they'll call him Bob Wilson Clough. Peter once said to me that we've got to win football matches because of the things that Brian says. He would say things about his bosses or the FA or whatever uh, that the man in the street wanted to say, I think, half the time. You stop Brian Clough talking, he might as well cut his right arm off. Sadly, for Derby County, club chairman Sam Longson was not amused by his manager's natural gift for upsetting the establishment. And the chairman. Come on, let's get down to sanity. And in October 1973, an increasingly tense relationship unraveled into the end game. And that's all, gentlemen, at this stage. No, the, no questions, whatever. Well, he resigned at the finish. There was an argument, and then Brian and Peter, I think, actually signed letters of resignation, which that was obviously a, a bad move. Do you see this as a personal... To Clough's astonishment, the board accepted his decision. I resigned and they've accepted it. I think one of the points was that he was spending too much time on television. Brian was never going to be told, certainly by his chairman, what he should be saying in football. 
and it was sad. Two men who respected each other initially should fall out in the way they did. Brian, why have you resigned? There's not enough time, there's not enough film, there's a million reasons. It's the biggest mistake they made, him and Peter. There's no doubt about that. Will you stay with Brian, do you think? Yes. Whatever happens? Yes. That night, Brian Clough was back on TV. If you've been wondering what this is in my hand, it's a nail. And it's either going in Poland's coughing or it's going in Sir Alf's. Do you remember the, uh, the goalkeeping exploits of the Polish goalkeeper? Then he proceeded to knock England out of the competition. Hunter, right foot! But he was absolutely adamant he wasn't a very good goalkeeper and called him a clown. That other clown at the other end. Brian, was. you keep yeah. calling him a clown. That's wrong. But in yeah. fact, that yeah. fellow has made yeah. some fantastic that, saves no, and he's, he's kept England no, right. But that wouldn't have worried Brian Clough one jot, you know? Three days later, he would have been still saying he was a clown. It's only opinion. Makes the world go round. We <laughs> love <laughs> If Clough was a master of self-promotion who reveled in playing the agitator, he reserved his greatest contempt for one manager and one club. What did Brian Clough think of Leeds United? Hate. Disliked them immensely at the time. Disliked the manager, Don Revy. Daddy! Yeah, hated each other. The majority of Saturday mornings, Brian would be on the back pages saying what he felt about Leeds United, what he felt about Don Revy. I think they sold themselves short as men and as players. He didn't like their methods, their way. They did have quite a reputation, didn't they? Dirty. Dirty Leeds. I mean, that's what people say, yeah. Giles has a two-footed tackle. Brian Clough's attitude towards the Leeds thing was that we were dishonest. <laughs> I would say that the villain of football is the one that does the most things wrong. Well, I don't think Leeds ever got the credit for playing the type of football that they played. I mean, I played in a Leeds team that played as good a football as any Brazilian team or any team I've ever done. Giles! And a goal! When you look at the great sides over the years, you know, there's one that comes up every now and then, an exceptional team, and I think we were one of them teams. A goal! A typical Lorimer effort! I think they could have been a little bit more loved. He wanted them to keep up the standards that his teams would keep up. He had a point, didn't he? Um, when you well, looked at Leeds' disciplinary record? Yeah, of course. Well, in life, I don't think you find the nice guys win very much. And yeah, the bloke who pinches two million pounds will sit back in his, in his bungalow in the Bahamas or wherever the hell he goes and says, well, I've been an out-and-out -out thief and I've had the most success. It just depends which standards you're looking for. Might get caught, though. Yeah, well, Leeds have been caught a lot of times. But in 1974, the league champions needed a new manager. Leeds United directors announced that they have accepted the resignation of Mr Don Revy to free him to accept the appointment as England team manager. And rumour spread of a marriage made in hell. We were on holiday in Mallorca because uh, he'd splashed out that year and we'd gone to Mallorca. Uh, so we were there and he got the call about going to Leeds, went home. Uh, he flew home, I think, to London to meet them, flew back and said, we're not going to Brighton after all. <laughs> we're off to Leeds instead. July 31st, 1974, and only seeing was believing. This week we welcome Brian Clough to Leeds in his new job, manager of Leeds United, successor to Don Revie, and a man in charge of the Leeds machine, the most successful combination in British football. Brian, Brian, this way. It would be like Arsene Wenger taking over the job at Manchester United. Now that is extreme. It's not extreme enough. Oh, crikey, I mean, there would be no equivalent today, I'm afraid. Brian! He couldn't get a more controversial appointment at all than Brian Clough going to Leeds at that moment in time. It really was major. Significantly, Clough's partner, Peter Taylor, had decided to remain at third division Brighton. I practised at Headingley that day, that morning, and after lunch I went down to see him. And there was zillions of people and camera crews. I've got work to do. Will you please right, let well, me get on with my work? Yeah. And we went into his office. I had a cup of tea and sat down chatting to him. 
The first thing he said to me, he'd looked at the age of the plane staff. They were all beginning to get old. So although Don Revy had had a very good, successful side, he could see that this couldn't go on. He could see things very quick, and he could get to the point that mattered. And obviously the Leeds players didn't like that, did they? Leeds have always sold themselves short. They've been champions, and they've not been good champions. He probably thought, I can go there and I'll change them. I think Brian Clough worked in a certain way. He had to dominate you, and he had to def you had to defer to him. And once you defer to him, then he'd start building you up in his own image. We're waiting for it to be controversial and outspoken, and we certainly weren't um, let down, that's for sure. I don't think it will take them long to realise that I'm a very, very honest manager. I think they will have <coughs> realised that already. That's when, of course, we had this uh, meeting um, of the players where Brian was strong and very abusive, really, to most of the guys. He came in and basically ripped into everybody of won your medals, be cheating. All the medals you've won, you can get them and throw them over there in the bin, which didn't get off to it. a good start. The lads were totally shocked. I mean, we knew he'd be outspoken, but we didn't think it'd be anything like what he was. And you've got to remember, these players had won the league in style the previous season. If he had any hope of getting a relationship going with, with players like that, influential players in the dressing room, it was gone within a day or so. I was still hearing about Don Revy talking to the players, and, you know, and, and I knew Brian had been very critical of the Leeds players, but I surmised that, you know, they might give him a chance. There's no doubt who's in the hot seat. It's the new Leeds United manager, Brian Clough. Yes, Under Clough, Leeds made their worst start to a season in 15 years. Telling us, I hope, what went wrong. The Leeds machine had lapsed into malfunction. He's in with the shot and he is 3 0 as the crowd erupts. Those goals watching them again, you know, they've caused me as much pain as it did yesterday. Things that he'd said about Leeds United, their certain players resented it and uh, we're not going to play for him, and I don't think they did play for him. They did everything they could to get him out. What were the players thinking at the time? Oh, out. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. He didn't expect quite the hostility that there was. You know, he must have felt very alone in that job um, because of the, the atmosphere, dreadful atmosphere there. I think he did believe that Don recommended him for the job, and I, I, I wanted the job and would actually plot against him. That I, wasn't the case? No. No. Brian Clough's attitude to football was the complete opposite to the attitude that was there at Leeds at that time. And I think it, it was a clash that neither of us could understand. Everybody's got something in, they hate in life. My personal, I don't like rats. I, I can't stand rats. I think Brian, we were rats to Brian Clough. He couldn't stand us. It was bedlam the, the first couple of weeks. There's, there's no doubt about that. It was, there, was, there was nearly anarchy at the football club. Have you read a novel with a real person to name it? I keep asking people and they say, no, I haven't really. The portrayal of Brian Clough in that book is absolutely outrageous. It's dreadful, it's mean, it's mean-spirited, and it's wrong. The Damned United was published three years ago to critical acclaim. It tells the story of Brian Clough's rise at Derby and his fall at Leeds. I dismissed it at first as just another book. I got it and, and read it, and I, I was quite horrified. Writer David Peace does not claim to have written the truth. He says his novel is a portrait of Clough, not a photograph. In The Damned United, he imagines the workings of Clough's mind. This is fiction based on fact, whatever that's supposed to mean. So anybody reading, reading the book wouldn't know what this guy considers fiction and considers fact, and it becomes very, very confusing. The language was absolutely... I mean, Brian just, he didn't need that language to express himself. I'm sure you, you're aware of that. And they had him chain-smoking, and he'd given up smoking years before. And they had him with a, a drink constantly there, and he barely drank in those days. 
It says in the book, he burnt Don Revy's desk. Well, I don't, well, we were supposed to be there, I think, me and Simon, that day. We'd have remembered if there was a bonfire going off, because we, we quite liked bonfires when we were young, so we'd have certainly remembered that. I don't remember any of that. Now, when you look at the cover of the book, he's leading leads out. Well, you just have to look at him. You know, he's a picture of youth and health and fitness, and it just doesn't square with the, the picture in the, in the book. I think I behaved him as a raven lunatic in the book. It was totally outrageous. And I think the hurt that he's caused the, the Clough family through that is, is dreadful. He's just taking it on himself to write this book, this awful book. Then I heard they were making a film. In The Damned United, the movie, Michael Sheen stars as Clough in what's been called a more flattering portrayal. There would be no Derby County without me. No league title, no champions of England, not without Brian Clough. I think our view was that we needed to make a slightly different kind of take on Brian Clough than, than David Pieces. The first thing you can do for me is to chuck all your medals and all your caps and all your pots and all your pans into the biggest dustbin you can find. We were able, in a sense, to push a lot of the, the, the darkness out of, of the movie and make a movie that is that, where the narrative is very, very clear. Yeah, this fella talks too much. They say he's another Muhammad Ali. Now, Clough, I've had enough. Stop it. Are you going to stop it? Uh, no, I'm going to thank him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the director of the film has assured us that it is a warm, affectionate um, film and nothing like the book. Who do you think you are? Frank Clough. And yet, I'm sure when the film comes out, it's going to say, based on the book by David Peace. So how he squares that, I don't know. David Peace has pangs of regret about writing The Damned United. When asked to respond to the specific concerns of the Clough family, Peace refused to comment. How were you described in The Damned United? As the Irishman. And I was always the one with the lads at the back of the bus saying certain things and doing certain things. And I really resent that because it's just not true. And that's why I sued him. I sued him and won. It's no coincidence that the main characters in that book, whether it be Brian Clough, Don Reavy, Billy Bremner, all passed away and couldn't take the legal action I, t I took. He's not here to defend himself, is he? You know, you can't, that, that was the, the legal thing, you can't libel the dead. Because had they been alive, that book would never have got out. Ever. I haven't done things according to the book. Brian, 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 Brian. Brian. <laughs> Tonight, the football world was stunned by the shock news that after only seven weeks in the job, Brian Clough has been sacked as manager of Leeds United. <laughs> it was live, yes. <laughs> They managed uh, extraordinarily, because in those days you could be very flexible in ITV, to get Don Revy to agree to come on and Clough to agree to come on. Sacked after only 44 days, it was Clough's intention to depart with a flourish. That night he faced the cameras and his biggest critic. It just went like magic from the moment they came in. Brian said that there was no warmth in the club. Now, that really shook me. Did I say no warmth? You said no warmth in Leeds United. Well, Revy, the man who was revered almost as a god and tended to behave in a godlike fashion, and Clough, who was earthy, human, responsive, uh, you know, alive. Of course they were playing Austin. their best. They Hold couldn't do anything else. It was second nature to them. Revy was there to put Clough in his place. Revy uh, was insulted and hurt because Clough had been critical of his cold distant approach to the team, and he wanted to teach Clough a lesson. I knew the players. Clough, as he calls me Revy, didn't know them. I openly stated, before anybody took the job, when I took the England job, that I felt that Johnny Jarvis was the man for the job. But there have been claims that there was, in fact, a vote of no confidence passed by the players. That is absolutely correct. Well, how did you react to that? Oh, I wanted to be sick. Oh, I wanted to be sick. I honestly feel, knowing Leeds United players, as long as I've known them, they must have had a very good reason to do that. No respect to Brian, 
They must have had a very good reason to do that. I mean, if Peter Mandelson had been around, he could probably have tutored Revy in putting a little warmth into it uh, uh, and uh, saying, you know, I feel your pain, Brian, and all that kind of crap. Obviously, to be sacked, as you profoundly put it, and the only way you could put it, is a very sad one. It's a very sad one for me personally, and I also believe a very sad one from Leeds Football Club's angle and from the Leeds City. Do you feel like you were given a chance in the job? Well, seven weeks is hardly a long time to be given a chance in any job. I would hope that uh, Mr Revy would get a lot longer time in his job. I don't believe they've done Leeds Football Club a service. I don't care whether it's me or whoever it was. I'm talking about a manager. I think they've struck a blow to send us back, you know, back in the dark ages. He was speaking to the camera, and that meant he was speaking to the people out there. He was justifying... Uh, his approach to Leeds United fans and to the world. I believe in a different concept of football to Don. It can be played slightly different to the way Don plays it and get the same results. I'm a little bit of an idealist. I do believe in fairies and that is my, you know, outlook. What emerged was the true nature of the people. Don's slightly different and his record proves over results that he perhaps is right. But having said that, I want to be like me. So you've got the real people, and that's what's important. Truthfully, um, Brian is a fool of himself. When you'd criticise them so much and said, we should be in the second division for this and we should do this and we should do that, why do you take the job? Well, because I thought it was the best job in the, in the country. Of course it was the best job I in the country. I was taking over the league champions. I want to win the league, but I want to win it better. He's dead right. That's what he'd want to do. Yeah, but there's no way he could win it better. Why not? Only... No, 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 no. But that's the only hope we're, I've got. We're doing, the, we're doing lots four matches, isn't it? But that, well, I can only lose three. No, 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 no. There was no way we could have won it better. No, I don't think so. He wouldn't see that as belittling uh, Don Revy. Didn't see that at all. It wasn't meant as a, a criticism. I wanted to do something you hadn't done. It'd be the same now if it, if it was a Manchester United situation and somebody, you know, take over from Sir Alex or whatever, he'd want to do it differently and, if at all possible, better. I believe it's a fraction whether you took the England job or had another shot at the European Cup. That is totally true, because I was so involved with the players and, and everybody at Elden Good lad. Now, I wanted to do that and I want to do it better than you. You can understand that, can't you? Yes. Clough was Kennedy, new, bright, brash, and Revy was, uh, well, it was Nixon. If it allowed him to reach across and strangle Clough, he would have been much happier. <laughs> but he knew he couldn't do that and he couldn't win and it wasn't his ground. Gentlemen, there we must leave it after what's been a tragic day for Leeds United supporters, of which I number myself one. Gentlemen, thank you very much and good night. Why is Mr Clough the wrong man now when he was the right man exactly? The embattled Leeds yeah. chairman was Manny Cousins. The, the, the board thinks that... Uh, Clough's contract, worth around £100,000, was paid up in full. Brian got us wrong. He put us down to a set of villains and vagabonds, but uh, that is not the case, I can tell you. We were parting company uh, in a very friendly way. Would you agree with that, Brian? I mean, how can you feel friendly about being sacked? I'm feeling very friendly towards Mr Cousins. Uh, everything is fine between him and I. He got a good settlement from them, uh, and in the middle of a season, he was free. Uh, no football, as a family time, it was superb. He just shrugged it off. And we had a very nice Christmas because he wasn't working. <laughs> so it was great. <laughs> very relaxed, nice Christmas. It hurts any sportsman's pride to be sacked, uh, to be thought of as uh, not good enough to do the job. Sure, but in the end, I mean, he succeeded and Leeds didn't. And I want to tell all my friends that have sent condolences and, and cards and feel very, very sorry for me, please don't, because you're looking at the happiest man that was in football. October 2008, Liverpool. Brian Clough is being inducted into the European Football Hall of Fame. I'm an Evans supporter, I'm just a lot of collector in German, I'm an Evans supporter, Nigel. Pretty much everybody who's who in European football in the last 25 or 30 years is here. A lot of them who he competed against. Brian's two sons, Nigel and Simon, and his eldest grandchild, Stephen, will accept the award. If you brought up in a musical family and your mum and dad play a musical instrument, you're going to play musical instruments, you know? If you brought up and your dad's into football, you want to play football. And me and Simon were just the same. 
out of bounds. I know how special the evening is going to be, and I know uh, how much I would have liked my father to be here in person to put us all at ease. He'd have lapped it up. Yeah. He'd have absolutely lapped it up. I think he'd still be holding court on the steps out there now. <laughs> We've got photographs, I'm sure you've seen them, where they're totally involved, you know, in what's happening. They used to love it. And, of course, if they could sit in the dugout, they were happy. But now, of course, health and safety, you can't. <laughs> Today, without question, we have the most remarkable match of the season. It's Brighton against Bristol Rovers. The man at the centre of that game was Brighton manager Brian Clough, and he's with us again this afternoon. This will be the number six, I would think, and it is. The young Clough sons have something to smile about. I think Dad's got too much to smile about, though. I just remember sitting on there. I think we were shrinking <laughs> back as the goals just kept going in, you know, just shrinking. I've got Nigel Clough here with me. He wants to see the eight Bristol Rovers goals go in again. And here's Warboys, and that's Bristol Rovers' eighth. You, know, you go home, you have your tear, whatever, you get over it, and, uh, you know, and then many years later you get an inkling of <laughs> how it must have felt. What did you think of Brighton yesterday? All right. All right. Well, that's good. Oh, la, la. OK. Oh, la, la, la. What did he call you, the player? Number nine, most of the time, yeah. The relationship changed when we worked with each other uh, for a while, uh, so that sort of uh, puts a strain on things inevitably. Very early on, I think it was a youth team game that I was due to play in, and uh, I'd, on a Friday night, uh, I went round to my girlfriend's house. She was babysitting for a younger brother, and I got in, I don't know, half 10, 11 o'clock, and he said, right, that's it, you're not playing tomorrow. And I said, well, I've just been you know, out for a couple of hours watching television, putting my feet up, I don't care. He said, you're not playing tomorrow. And next morning, obviously, I didn't turn up, and I get a phone call from the youth team manager, where are you? <laughs> and he hadn't told the youth team manager that I wasn't coming. I said, well, I got told by the manager last night I wasn't playing. He said, well, he never told us. <laughs> I wish my father was still here. I get that most days of my life, and I certainly get it on an evening when I see him being honoured for something which I wish he'd received while he was still here to uh, take it for himself. OK. Hi, good day. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah, no he wanted them to be able to mix with people and converse with people, you know, not just sort of stand there, you know. And um, and I think they did. They never stop. You know, when you look in the floodlights and the wind and rain is coming down oh, sideways. Yeah. Right? Oh. <laughs> He is also turning into me, Father. His managerial style might not seem to be very like him, but it's very similar. And also, he's starting to walk like him as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Clough. Please welcome his son, Nigel. He scored two goals in a League Cup final once. Yep. Did he congratulate you after that? No. He would have been, uh, I think, truly humbled, which he wasn't very often uh, in the sort of company. <laughs> When you were capped for England, did he congratulate you? Uh, no. We never talked about those things. <laughs> and when he'd retired, it took probably a few good years, and the bond then that comes back into his grandchildren. I think that brings your family much closer together. Got the award here, keeping that safe. Yeah, I think that's a testament of the success, the longevity of it, you know. People still talk about it now, 30 years on. Did you ever consider that you would never return to football? Oh, many, many times. Uh, I'd had such a good time, or was having such a good time, uh, making a, a success of my marriage and, and my family life. Uh, it was utopia for me. You have to be a bit mad to be a manager. I'm sure you agree. <laughs> Brian! <laughs> Four months after being sacked by Leeds United, Brian Clough became the manager of Nottingham Forest, a run-down corner shop of a club struggling to stay in the second division. He came in in 1975, January, a really cold morning in January, threw the coat off to the side in the dressing room and said, right, well, we're off to work. But we weren't thinking that day that this man was here going to change the, the course of our lives. The arrival of Peter Taylor certainly switched him on, 100%. If you trace our career back, whether it be at Brighton or at Derby, there was always plenty of goals, Gary. Normal services now resumed. <laughs> I mean, this is not a seven-day wonder. We've always produced goals. But even I was surprised with the speed of success at Nottingham Forest because 
to do something as quickly as that was nothing short of a miracle. O'Neill wins it. Clough's squad was a mix of steady pros. Oh, yes! Unfulfilled talent. Robertson got his cross in, there's a touch, and it's in there! And bad boys. They were transformed by a unique brand of man management. Something about him, the aura about the man. He can make you do anything. And Kenny Burns takes the trophy to lift it to the Forest fans on this night. He would give me the big, you know, the, the old or AOK. It was like a pat on the back from Brian Clough. And then when you do that, you want to get another one. Oh, what a goal! What a beautiful goal! John Robinson! He would shout my name and I'd turn around and he would give it. And when I got that, when I got that, I just wanted the ball all day. You know, I just wanted to play. He looks up for O'Neill to score goal number two. The green-eyed monster of jealousy was when my friend John Robertson was getting all the praise, you know, that little that little sign of well done, and, and it wasn't forthcoming in my direction. We had a difference of opinion about my ability. I thought I was brilliant, and, um, and he didn't. He saw things clearly, probably saw things that maybe other people didn't see, you know, um, in, in terms of people's personalities. Um, I think he weighed people up very well. Was that the Clash's song, was it? I fought the law and the law won. Well, he won. Not everybody liked him, but I think I had him when he was at his peak. Uh, that's the way I like to look on him. What was his philosophy about how the game should be played? Just very, very simple. Simplicity. Everything we did was very, very simple. We never tried anything difficult. Get on. Free kicks, shoot. Indirect, touch it side and shoot. That's it. Very, very simple. You see a man, pass it to him. Yes! We just didn't practice anything. And McGovern, 2 1. Consolidation to Clough was. <sighs> What's consolidation? You know what I mean? What are you looking for? Average? That's what consolidation is. You know, we're going to win things. You know, we're going to prove to people that we're winners. Three years after his arrival, Clough became only the second manager to win the league championship with two different clubs. And then he signs the world's first million pound player. Yeah, and he did. And he played him on the right wing. <laughs> Trevor. 500,000 was the record at the time, so I actually doubled it by going for a million pound. I had my best suit on, collar and tie. He had his squash racket in his hand. He was dressed for the occasion, wasn't he? I'll put that there just in case he makes a balls of it. Just... <laughs> they didn't know from day to day what he was going to do, what he was going to say. Young man, to be the best in anything, it's got to be very special. Get your hands out of your pockets. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, sir. He believed in that, I think, keeping them on their toes. And I think they loved it. I do. I think they absolutely loved it. Now, you might not have seen him every single minute of every single day, but his influence was there all the time. It was his football club, and that was important, and you knew that, and that was it. One of the accusations, you know, that was always labelled against Brian Clough was that he ruled with fear. Fear is probably the wrong word. I think some players were in awe of him, but they also felt very relaxed about going out and playing for him. I think they'd fall out with me if I changed. He took the fear out and played to their strengths, and they were, couldn't wait to get on the pitch and play for him. They really couldn't. It's an instinct for how other people are feeling, and uh, he just knew how other people across the board, and it didn't matter. He just knew how other people were feeling. But how many people knew what he was feeling? He kept that uh, much more guarded. Clough no longer liked the sound of his own voice quite as much. He used to enjoy being in the limelight. I thought it got out of hand a little bit. He was more reclusive. I decided, you know, to concentrate on running the club. Achievement brought less pleasure and more pressure. He'd be sitting, you know, and you could see his mind ticking, ticking round. <laughs> He used to say that the most important job a manager does is picking the team. You know, every Friday it was, you know, quite tense. You know, when you're in your late 30s or whatever, you know, uh, I think he felt he could take on the world. And, you know, 
as time gets on, that diminishes slightly. But nobody ever got a hint of that, the vulnerability of it all. We don't hide anything here. We reduce things perhaps to a little bit of simplicity where other managers might, you know, find them complex. I think he felt the responsibility of, of everybody else, really, more than well, he did. He felt that responsibility, looking after everybody else more than himself. I can understand that, the pressure mounting on him, because once you achieve something, um, expectations levels from everyone else is higher, and they expect you to deliver. Now Battles! Going all the way, Battles! You wanted to please him. You wanted to go out and do your utmost to please him so that he would have that respect for you that, uh, that you were craving. This need to know that you meant something in his life. If it means abiding by a few little rules, and if we have discipline running right through the club so they can come back at half-time and win cup finals, then they want me every day of the week. But what Brian Clough wanted most of all was the supreme job. He spoke what he thought was right. If you do anything wrong against that mob in there, it don't last five minutes. I think the establishment in, in any field are frightened of outspoken people. They don't just look at your CV, how good you are, and what you might achieve, how you might handle the players. They look at how they might handle you. December 1977, England manager Don Revy had defected to coach the United Arab Emirates. The national game needed a saviour. Oh, if he, if he could have managed England, it would have been his absolute dream job. But now we come to Brian Clough, and I know it's delighted the whole big match team to see just how the mail has flowed in about him in this last week, and a swing to about 95% in favour of the fella. Brian Clough was the public's choice. My man for the job has always been Brian Clough. I think Clough and Taylor have all the, have all the qualities needed at this moment. The choice of a huge percentage of people within football. Unanimously. It was uh, Brian Clough first, second and third. There was no contest. It wasn't a campaign, it was a, it was a rubber stamp. They were saying, this is going to happen. I was called up for an interview and the other two there were Bobby Robson and Brian Clough. Brian thought, what well, waste of time, the rest of us coming, because he, he was the right man for it. It's never been heard of someone walking out of the England managerial position. It was a unbelievable opportunity, you know, for the FA to appoint the best manager in the country, and that was Brian Clough. It's a bit cold, isn't it? <laughs> he had a certain amount of hope that it would sort of go well. Yes, definitely, uh, based on his achievements in football. I've always liked the England job, or even, you know, I'm delighted to have even been associated with it, because I didn't get to this stage last time. We sat there in the entranceway at Lancaster Gate, and I remember an elderly gentleman coming in and started to go up the stairs, and he waited a bit, puffing and panting a wee bit, and, and Cluffy said, hey, hey, do you think you can manage those stairs? You might as well get the lift. I don't think you'll make it to the top. And I thought, oh, that's a good start, because he was on the panel that was going to interview us. And so that was one vote down before he got in the door. He thought, and he's always thought, all his life that he gave a good interview. He would think, I'm not bothered if you like me, just respect me. Management's essential in any football club, however big or ho however small. Uh, and I feel the Football Association should have the best manager. And please don't ask me who that is. All I know is that he gave his best. And he thought he'd gone well, met, met, met what he thought was reasonable men, and he was delighted. However, according to the man who headed up the FA's press office, the interview process was flawed. Ron Greenwood actually wasn't on the candidate list. Why? Well, presumably because he'd already been lined up. So before Brian Clough and the others walked through that door to be interviewed, Ron Greenwood has already got the job. That's the conclusion that I draw from it. No actual mention of, of Brian Clough, but the 
the chairman reported that he hoped that the decision of the electoral committee would be announced on Monday, the 12th of December. Who didn't want it to happen? Sir Harold Thompson. Everybody was scared stiff of him. And very few people had the intellect or the strength of character to, to withstand him. Everyone said, oh, they'll be frightened of him. And of course they were. Could you explain your reaction when you were telephoned with the news? I, I heard it on the wireless, actually, just before we went into lunch. Uh, so it was, a, it was a nice occasion, yes. There wasn't a vote. The decision was made beforehand. The chairman would have said, I want to appoint Ron Greenwood, and they would have agreed. Was that the way that Sir Harold Thompson behaved? Yes. The electoral committee wasn't a standing committee, and therefore its minutes are not recorded. So what is said in that meeting remains in that meeting? Absolutely. That's the way things were done. Who would have been your choice, Laurie? Uh, Cluffy. Cl Cl yeah, Brian at that time. Brian Clough. Oh, totally agree on that, yeah. yeah. Look, in hindsight, looking back, which is we can all now, I don't think he had a catty and else chance. If he'd have been around in this day and age, they would have been knocking his door down to, to get him to manage England. The diplomatic bit, I think they were a bit worried about that, um, what he would maybe tell the Germans about the war. And if you look at a number of the England footballers in recent times, they don't perform for the England national side as they do for the club sides. And the public knew that with Brian Clough, there is no way any player would play for England if he didn't reproduce his club form. Because it's a young man, you're not playing very well, you're out. He was dreadfully disappointed, but not too surprised, I don't think. The second that you lose sight of the top job, it's called ambition, actually. You might as well pack in, wrap it up and just go home and fade away. The greatest English manager that England never had. Nervous, excited, daunted. <laughs> It brings back a lot of emotions and a lot of memories and uh, the children will be there, he does grandchildren, so it'll be lovely for them as well, they're pleased just because they get half a day off school. The Market Square in Nottingham, where the city is about to witness the second coming of Brian Clough. It's a nine foot high bronze statue of Brian, um, and I can't reveal more than that at this stage, even at this stage. Would you please give a special welcome to Mrs. Barbara Clough. Mum's had the most to do with choosing it. She's been uh, worrying about it, I think, for a few weeks now, if not months. And uh, it's a big thing for her, for the whole day, really. There's some great stars here. Tony Woodcock, his hair's getting longer and longer. Let's hear it for Brian Clark. £70,000 contributed by the people of Nottingham. Can we have the next group, please, which is the immediate family, which is grandchildren and... It's like a wedding. I think he'd be so pleased. I think he'd be in tears, probably, if he saw that. You know, I'm sure he will see it. Don't you think that it's the building's lovely. good yeah, here? Yeah, it is. It is the way with the buildings as yes, well. And, uh, yes, yeah. I, I think it's wonderful. In many years to come, there'll be people in Nottingham.